participants like Robert did. Or chat window. <laughs> it's like they know the other, yeah. other set of monitors here. Okay. I activate my broadcast. I will once it allows them in. Well, good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us today at CDAC, the Energy Code Training Webinar uh, on Air Sealing, Infiltration, and Ventilation. Uh, my name is Ryan Siegel. We also have Robert Nemeth with us here. And before we start, I would like to mention a few housekeeping items. Uh, if you do have questions, uh, please use the question and answer window. Uh, if you do have uh, comments or have difficulties, uh, please go ahead and use the uh, webinar chat function. We will be taking questions uh, towards the end of this webinar, uh, but feel free to ask the questions as you think of them. Uh, this webinar is being recorded uh, and will be made available uh, as well as a PDF of the presentation slides, uh, which will be made available at the CDAC website. So to give a little bit of background about who we are, the Smart Energy Design Assistance Center, uh, we are an applied research program here at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and we are a public-private partnership uh, working in collaboration with the 360 Energy Group uh, out of Chicago. We provide advice and analysis to facilities to achieve energy efficiency savings and our primary goal is to reduce the energy footprint of the state of Illinois. This program is being provided through sponsorship by the Illinois EPA as part of the Illinois Code Training Program. We're available to, be, uh, to provide assistance in several different ways. Uh, we have technical support through an 800 number or an email address, energycode at cdac.org. We also provide many online resources uh, at our website. We also offer in-person workshops, uh, webinars online, such as the one that you are in today. Uh, we also have online uh, on-demand training modules uh, regarding the energy code. Uh, so this can be uh, taken at any point uh, in time, day or night, uh, at your convenience. So this is our uh, Energy Code website, cdac.org slash energy code. And before we get started, I want to learn a little bit about our uh, those of you in attendance today. So should have a poll question come up here. And let us know about uh, your All right, looks like we're mostly architects and engineers with some other people, uh, and very split here, residential and commercial industrial. So that's very good to see, and so uh, hopefully we'll see lots of benefit from uh, today's webinar. So, and with that, I will turn the, it over to Robert Nemeth. Good afternoon, ladies. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Ryan, um, let's start out with some 
basic definitions here. Is that on? Um, air sealing. Uh, this uh, today's webinar is about air sealing and air barriers and infiltration. Um, so air sealing. That's we're trying to restrict the amount of air leaking into our building, which is basically infiltration. When we have infiltration, we also have exfiltration. We can't just allow air into our buildings. Uh, we, there's also air, there's an, uh, an equivalent amount of air leaking out of it, uh, which would be exfiltration. And to uh, reduce that infiltration and exfiltration, we use air barriers. And we're gonna be covering uh, the ins and outs of that today. So why do we worry about air sealing? Well, we've got uh, several reasons. Um, energy conservation, uh, temperature control, uh, moisture control, air quality control, envelope durability, comfort and health. So the uh, conservation is, is, is a very important aspect, reducing um, uh, the amount of energy we use, reducing our energy footprint, the uh, temperature control, if we have a drafty building with air leaking um, in at all different types of places, we have, uh, it becomes hard to control the temperature and that impacts uh, comfort. Um, and the moisture control is a very important issue because uh, when air moves through the building assembly, um, it carries with it moisture. And if the humidity inside our walls gets high enough, uh, we can grow mold. We don't even need to have condensation occurring. We can just have humidity high enough. And if the spores have enough moisture, um, we get mold problems. Um, that can um, impact air quality because as the air leaks through our buildings, it picks up whatever is in our walls and delivers it to the inside of the building, be it mold spores or uh, vermin that's inside our walls, possibly mice and, and, and things of that nature. And then the envelope durability, obviously, if we have components in our wall that are slowly rotting away, um, it's gonna impact the durability of our um, envelope. So that ha all has also impacts on health. So is air sealing a big deal? Yes, it is. Um, if you, this was from a study done in 2014 uh, by the DOE. And it shows across the nation here is, let's use the residential sector for right now. You take a look at how much energy was expended f to uh, mitigate infiltration, it was 2.26 quads, and one quad is 10 to the 16th, or 15th, I'm sorry. Um, that's a lot of energy. So you can see that infiltration is higher than what we lost, that the energy lost through the foundation, through walls, roofs, uh, windows. It was the, the biggest cost. Um, in the residential sector on the heating side. And you can see on the commercial side, it's also a big deal. It's not quite as big as the walls, but um, still it's a large quantity of energy that we consume just to mitigate infiltration into our buildings. So the importance uh, um, of the air barrier uh, and its mandatory use was first introduced in ASHRAE in, in 2010, which that's not really that long ago. And in the ICC, it was 2012. Um, prior to 2012, IEC, IC, IECC addressed sealing a building envelope, but it did not specify continuous air barrier. You know, we've known for a long time that uh, the leakage of air is a big deal and it costs a lot of money, but um, it, as you can see, it wasn't brought into the codes until recently. And, and my take on that is it, we've done an incredible job over the decades of increasing the efficiency of buildings uh, due to increased insulation levels. Well, insulation is a very tangible thing. We can see it, we can touch it, we attribute an R value to it. Whereas air leakage, it's this invisible thing that's kind of leaking into our building and costing us money and degrading our envelope assembly. 
well, it finally made it into the codes here in uh, 2010 and 2012. So it is a, it's a very big deal, as you saw on that last slide, of how much energy we, we expend uh, mitigating uh, infiltration. So um, what causes uh, infiltration? Well, we have wind effects, wind blowing on the side of the building and then creating a vacuum on the opposite side of the building. So uh, the building wanting to leak air on the pressure side and, and leak, air, leak air in on the high pressure side and leak air out on the low pressure side. We've got the stack effect of warm air rising in a building and then wanting to leak out at any opening it can find, such as around can lights or utility penetration, such as ducts from rooftop units and things like that, which creates a vacuum at the bottom or a negative pressure at the bottom of the structure and then sucking in cold air down low and then the warm air leaking out up high. And then we have a host of combustion and ventilation type of uh, appliances that go in the building that are exhausting air, such as from bathrooms, which uh, both commercial and residential, uh, range hoods, which we'll find in both commercial and residential, and then uh, our combustion appliances, if they're not sealed combustion units, uh, creating a vacuum uh, for using the interior air for combustion and exhausting that and creating a negative pressure and then uh, causing air to leak into our building. So there's a host of ways or, or items or things that cause air to leak into our building. Uh, there's all kinds of le leakage locations, uh, doors, bathrooms, range hood exhaust, um, refrigerant line penetrations, utility pen other utility penetrations. Um, so it's, it's uh, a host of places where, where we're leaking air into buildings and out of buildings. You can see in the study that was done in Minnesota on 25 buildings that uh, most of the air leakage was through roofs and walls, 67%, and then exterior doors. Uh, exterior doors are oftentimes hard to seal, especially in commercial buildings, just because the weather stripping gets compromised fairly quickly, especially in high traffic areas. Um, but uh, you can see there's also the mechanical penetration windows and other instances. We were just at a school last week where there was uh, um, the aluminum frames were for the windows were butting up next to uh, concrete columns and uh, you could see daylight between the window frame and the concrete. Uh, the, the caulk joint had failed and uh, typical leakage point. So there are different pathways that the air leaks into buildings. Um, we have diffuse flow, which is through the materials. As you can see in that diagram there, or that schematic, we have air going through that CMU. Well, it's not a lot of air that's leaking through. That's really not the issue here. The orifice flow is uh, more of an issue, such as the cracking between the mortar and the CMU units, which provides a direct path to the inside. Or the worst is the channel flow, because that's where air gets in to the, uh, in this instance in the diagram there, it's leaking in through an electrical box, then the air is being filtered through fiberglass insulation until it eventually finds a way to get out into the, uh, uh, further on the outside of the wall. And in the process in cold weather, that um, air that's warm and humid on the inside starts to, the humidity rises as that cools and eventually it could possibly uh, condense on the inside of that wall, but it does not need to condense for it to create problems. A high, just a high humidity in itself can cause problems too. So there's various ways that that air sneaks into our buildings and sneaks out of our buildings. So we have uh, the air barrier system. There are certain requirements that it has to um, uh, meet. It has to be continuous. There was that diagram at the very beginning of this presentation with a, a building section with a red line around it. We should be able to draw a line around a building section that shows where the air barrier is. And it should be a continuous line. There has to be a certain amount of strength to the air barrier also. Um, imagine a CMU wall that moves uh, with, due to thermal stresses uh, or possibly settling and you get minor cracks. 
our air barriers need to be able to, to bridge those cracks as they develop and not be compromised. It needs to be durable and not uh, become fragile over time. It needs to be fairly stiff too because it might see both negative and positive pressure depending on which way the air is leaking in our building. And it needs to be impermeable to air. <clears throat> And it might provide a, a, a various function, other functions too. It might serve as our vapor barrier, depending on where that air barrier is. It might also be water resistant at times. So there it's serving a dual function. And it also improves the insulation effectiveness. If we're using fiberglass bats, fiberglass does not stop air movement. <clears throat> Uh, so if it's fairly ineffective at that, so if we use an air barrier, uh, our fiberglass becomes much more effective at doing what it's supposed to do, and that's insulating our building. So there are a lot of places in buildings, within buildings too, where air can leak from one place to another and cause problems. Here we're in a, a crawl space. I can't remember if this is a residence or a small commercial building, <clears throat> but you can see a mechanical chase here. <clears throat> and excuse me, uh, crawl spaces are typically or fairly often fairly wet, particularly if there's no vapor barrier, which there should always be a vapor barrier, but oftentimes there isn't. That air is humid. That humid air can, as it warms up, travels up these chases and goes through penetrations through the top plate where that plumbing stack goes through and creates problems in the attic. We have been in several attics where moisture from the crawl space has migrated up into the attic and caused all kinds of mold problems in the attic. And the moisture came from the crawl space. It was not from leaks from the roof or anything like that. So these types of chases need to be sealed. And building officials these days are, are fairly good at requiring builders to caulk around penetrations, electrical penetrations, plumbing penetrations, and things of that nature. <clears throat> and you can imagine here also where the warm, moist air could condense on the backside of these walls if somebody had the air conditioning turned down pretty low. So that would create a very high humidity environment in that chase and cause all kinds of problems. And these problems aren't <clears throat> immediate. They sometimes take years to, to appear before somebody notices that we have a serious problem here. <coughs> Excuse me. Here we have an attic hatch. It appeared to have been done very well with sash locks on it, trying to pull the, the, the hatch itself down tight to the uh, framing or the trim, I should say. And, but yet, still, you can see evidence of where air leaked around the perimeter and then condensed <coughs> or created a very high humidity environment just above where the insulation on the attic hatch ended. And you can see the consequence of that warm, moist air condensing on drywall and creating a mold problem. And uh, drywall just loves to grow mold. The paper on the face of drywall is a great substance for mold to grow on. <clears throat> and this, these are just typical uh, conditions, what we find in all kinds of buildings where penetrations have not been sealed, where air can leak in or out of uh, an assembly. <coughs> so here we have a blower door. And this instrument depressurizes a facility. That air at the bottom of that panel is, is that fan is blowing air to the outside and it's depressurizing the interior. And it's a very effective way of identifying where the air leaks are and also the quantity of those air leaks because it measures how much air is moving through that fan. It is not required for commercial construction, although some commercial buildings are doing that these days, but it is required. It's mandatory for residential construction. And the residential air leakage rate cannot exceed five air changes per hour at 50 pascals. And the 50 pascals is the equivalent of about a 20 mile per hour wind hitting the side of your building. 
So you do this after you've performed all the, uh, all the penetrations of the building thermal envelope. And here, it's an, uh, during these tests, it's really amazing where you find leaks sometimes. I walked through this doorway into this bathroom and felt a breeze, and I didn't know where it was coming from at first until we found out it was right at the strike plate here, and it was a really odd place, and we never really did figure out, is it coming from the attic? Is it coming from the crawl space? There really shouldn't have been air leaking there if your standard framing practices, we don't know where it would have come from. But uh, the solution was to really squirt some spray foam in that hole to stop that air leakage. I mentioned fiberglass insulation isn't very good at stopping air. Well, it's also that air carries moisture with it. This was in a brand new home, uh, hadn't even been occupied yet. And I was down in the crawl space with the gentleman, the, the site superintendent, and I asked him if I could pull a piece of insulation out between the uh, joists there. And he said, sure, go ahead. And I pulled it out and lo and behold, back behind that, I knew what I was gonna find, was uh, all kinds of moisture condensing on that rim joist. Uh, you can see this was, it was a cold conditions outside. The uh, insulation had actually frozen to the rim joist there but there was already mold starting to form and, and the superintendent obviously was very shocked. Um, and I, I can almost guarantee you all these have been resolved by now. But the, what the, the fiberglass allowed moisture and air to go through the, the fiberglass and condense on that band joist. And it's, uh, you can see the consequences of that. And once again, um, these are problems that this could have gone on undetected for years before you would have had a major problem at that point. So this is how it should have been insulated with uh, rigid foam and then spray foamed around the, the perimeter to seal it so that air and moisture cannot get to that band joist. So I'm gonna turn things over to Ryan here for a little bit. Well, thanks, Robert. And before we, we proceed here, uh, let, me, let me push out another poll here uh, to do a little bit of review as far as uh, what we have covered in the previous segment. So looking at, you know, what are the reasons why we will typically air seal? So if we'll take a moment here and answer this. Okay, looks like pretty much everyone was able to pick out that these are all the uh, reasons why we will do air sealing. Uh, and so uh, air sealing is very important for many different reasons. So as we've gone over that, uh, as far as why we air seal, uh, now we're gonna take a look at what the code actually calls out for uh, as far as the uh, air sealing and, and air barriers. Uh, and I'm not going to read all this text to you. This is just straight out of the code book. Uh, I will uh, note that on the residential uh, portion, this is the text as found in the Illinois amendments. Uh, so this is actually slightly different from the uh, original code text of the International Energy Conservation Code. Uh, but I will note that you can see there are, ver there are similarities between the commercial and residential uh, air leakage requirements. However, uh, one of the big differences is the commercial provision is 
an air leakage across the envelope. So a certain number of cubic feet per square foot of envelope area. Whereas the residential, it's based on a volumetric measurement as far as how many volumes of air uh, of the home uh, can be exchanged per hour. Uh, this difference, while seemingly small, can really pose challenges on the residential sector, uh, particularly for buildings that have low volume relative to surface area. Uh, so when you have uh, smaller homes, this can be a, a more difficult requirement to meet, uh, whereas when you have a very large home, uh, the volume is very different uh, as compared to uh, uh, the volume is very large relative to the surface area. Uh, So when we're talking about air barriers, this is a, a listing that the code provides as far as what qualifies as an air barrier material. Uh, several of these are, are obviously very uh, familiar to us, you know, gypsum board and drywall, uh, spray foam, insulation, uh, roofing membranes and the like. There may also be some other types that would qualify as an air barrier uh, based on the air leakage per surface area. Uh, so we typically, these fall under three types. Uh, fluid applied, which is uh, as depicted here, uh, where you can even see that these lines have been, uh, that the lines have been struck, uh, and then even all the nail penetrations have been uh, covered over. Here we've got some photos depicting membranes on the left. Uh, and then tapes on the right. Uh, tapes have come a long way, uh, but an important thing with all of these, you know, whether it's fluid applied or membranes or uh, tape, is making sure that, that you are cognizant of what material that you are applying these to, uh, to make sure that there is a compatibil compatibility between uh, the materials and your air barrier. Uh, as well as making sure that it's installed correctly. Uh, many of these tapes, there is actually standards as far as you know how much uh, force must be applied across the surface in order to get the complete adhesion that you are, uh, that's required for these. As noted earlier, uh, we do require continuous air barriers in the code. Uh, and that it needs to be provided throughout the building thermal envelope, uh, not just in certain sections. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, it's running along the inside wall and then down and around this uh, rim plate and then back into the drywall and back down. And on the right here, it's on the exterior, just coming across and then all the way down the face. Uh, so being aware that, that they can be on the inside or the outside, uh, and they could even be within the assemblies uh, that the envelope is made of. And where you particularly have problems is anywhere that you have two, uh, two types of framing that come, uh, come together, whether that's uh, the roof and the wall assembly, you know, the found, where the foundation meets the walls, you know, windows and doors meeting the wall, uh, any change in substrate. So if you go from, uh, you know, insulated concrete forms to structural insulated panels where you've made that change, uh, anywhere that you have expansion joints can be problems, uh, and between floors, as well as at any penetrations. Uh, and so anywhere that this boundary is penetrated, making sure uh, that mitigation strategies and, and uh, care is taken to uh, bring the air barrier back into uh, continuity. So some of the attributes of air barriers, it must be continuous, uh, and then the joints and seams have to be sealed, uh, include especially anywhere that materials change. Uh, as Robert noted earlier, to be able to withstand positive and negative pressure, uh, because the wind direction obviously will change from uh, time to time. 
uh, and the integrity of the air barrier uh, must be restored anytime there's penetrations. Uh, so making sure that anytime that we break that barrier or there is a joint in that barrier that we uh, get that seal returned uh, because it doesn't take much of a hole to bring that a lot that moisture through. It can cause mold. Uh, this is another table provided in the code, and I realize it's kind of busy, but we'll, we'll break this down piece by piece. Uh, but this is a, a table going over air barriers and insulation at various components uh, of residential, and many of these are also found in light commercial areas too. So as we noted earlier, the air barrier needs to be continuous. Uh, and it needs to be installed in the thermal envelope. Uh, and really, the air barrier and the insulation should be in intimate contact with one another uh, so that they can help each other become uh, the most effective that they can. Uh, on the insulation side, uh, as, as has been pointed out in, in a couple of occurrences, is making sure to not use any air permeable insulation to be used as a sealing material. Uh, so most any bat products, whether that's uh, denim, rock wool, uh, fiberglass, all of those are air permeable uh, to some degree and so therefore should not be used as an air barrier. Here looking at uh, a ceilings and attics, uh, particularly if you have drop ceilings and, dro and soffits uh, that are typically located kitchen, you know, over kitchen cabinets, bathrooms, uh, and the like. Frequently, because this is a, a very uh, difficult area to handle because of all the extra corners and, and things that have, uh, that get built in, is an easier way to build it is to make to build the entire room full height and then add your drop ceiling uh, and soffit later as an add-on uh, such that you can maintain your, your air barrier uh, across the top. And it makes your detailing much less uh, difficult because you end up with much many fewer corners. And as on the, the right, you can see the insulation, making sure that you're aligning the insulation with that air barrier. And if you do decide to go ahead and install the soffit and make sure you carry that insulation and that air barrier all the way through that profile uh, and making sure. One other problem that, that can be uh, encountered with this, if you do decide to insulate uh, and provide the air barrier into the soffit rather than just over the top is frequently we find that people like to put can lights in these soffits and if you have that soffit where it's actually exposed uh, you now have to deal with insulation contact rated cans, uh, air, uh, air sealed cans and the like and if you don't you could have something where the insulation that's just draped across that soffit will fall down uh, and make contact with that can that may not have originally intended for insulation contact, which could be a cause for a fire. Here looking at the, the walls, uh, air barrier, they're talking about the, the joint between the uh, wall and the uh, sill. One challenge that you can see, or that you can have with this is anywhere, particularly here with a concrete to wood contact, is not only do we have an air potential, but you also have a lot of moisture uh, because concrete can wick moisture uh, from the ground and that moisture can actually wick all the way into the wood. And so making sure to provide that sill gasket to provide that, not only that thermal break between the, the concrete and that wood, but also a moisture break uh, between those two. As we go over towards uh, installation and corners of walls, uh, here calling for uh, cavity insulation, typical uh, three-corner studs, walls, 
makes it very difficult because you end up with this cavity in here that is uninsulated. Uh, and with that cavity not being insulated, that's again uh, problems for thermal as well as moisture coming through. Uh, and so requiring that insulation be brought in to this uh, three stud corner uh, from the outside. Uh, alternatively, could be done as a California corner, which is in the center uh, depiction, where all we've done is turn that stud, we still provide that nailing flange for uh, that nailing surface for the drywall, uh, but just by turning that stud, it's now much easier to insulate the cavity uh, after the fact because insulation can be brought in from the inside. Uh, another method is to just use a corner with drywall clips, uh, which is more common uh, for commercial construction uh, and is now being seen more and more in residential construction because drywallers who deal in both residential and commercial are very familiar with the product and, and understand how to use it. So making sure that we insulate all the way into that corner uh, as well as any headers. Uh, so with headers, typically you'll end up with two by material. And previously it was just a half inch of uh, OSB or, or plywood that was the filler strip. Replacing that with insulation uh, is all that you need to provide that thermal break between the inside and outside uh, of that uh, header. So windows, skylights, and doors, uh, again, trying to re uh, bring that in that air barrier back in uh, here in the picture uh, you can see that there's about a half inch gap around that door that the, they've gone back then uh, and provide expanding foam uh, seal it to that to reinstall that air barrier now here they've even gone a step further and, and put caulk between all the studs uh, further minimizing uh, any air leakage, uh, but that's not necessarily required by the code itself. Uh, we've covered rim joists multiple times. Uh, rim joists, these are particularly problematic, uh, especially in crawl spaces, uh, but even sometimes in basements. And so making sure uh, that you do seal that rim joist area and prevent that moisture from getting to it because that rim joist is going to be cold. Uh, with floors, uh, making sure that the air barrier is uh, on all edges of exposed insulation. This is a problem area when you do typical ventilated crawl spaces. Uh, because you will typically have your, your moisture barrier or vapor barrier on the top uh, of the floor, and then you will put your insulation in, and then it is not uncommon to see that exposed, that insulation exposed on the bottom side of that floor. Uh, here it calls out that it needs to be sealed uh, on that exposed edge as well. So making sure that your insulation is, is providing uh, either as a type that provides an air barrier or that you provide full depth insulation such that you can actually provide a good uh, covering and air barrier uh, across that insulation face. Here looking at crawl spaces, uh, here's a good example of, a, uh, of an unventilated crawl space, uh, which is treated more as a uh, short basement rather than a typical crawl space is. And so by putting the insulation all the way on the outside walls, this becomes a conditioned uh, or semi-conditioned space. Uh, and here you'll notice that the exposed earth uh, is fully covered. And they've gone further and done fluid applied to make sure to seal every little joint uh, and penetration through that air barrier uh, to make sure that moisture is not migrating uh, moisture and air is not migrating into this space as best they, they can. So 
uh, something to be aware of when doing something like this is in these areas, these crawl spaces is to be aware when doing heating, ventilation, and air conditioning of these spaces and making sure that you do have good air, uh, air exchange. Uh, looking at one central Illinois home uh, last year, operated no heating or air conditioning during 79 days and had only 15 minutes or less of heating or air conditioning used 20 days. Uh, so that would make up over a quarter of the year with no heating or air conditioning operation. And so making sure to, uh, that provisions are made for that substantial part of the time where particularly in central Illinois, uh, and even as you go further north uh, or south, that we have a, a very temperate climate around here. And so making sure to address what do you do on all those days uh, that we don't use heating or air conditioning uh, to make sure that this air down here doesn't get stale and potentially moldy or musty. Uh, looking at shafts and penetrations, uh, this is a, a look at uh, a rear vented uh, fireplace. And uh, so you can see they've gone ahead and, and fire caulked uh, all the joints around it. And even going so far as to uh, caulking the joints in the, the flue there as well. Uh, and so making sure that any penetrations again are sealed. Uh, narrow cavities, making sure to cut the bat insulation, uh, cut it, cut them to fit, uh, or using a, a insulation that readily conforms uh, to the space. For garages, making sure that we air seal between the garage and the living space. Uh, as noted here in this picture, you know we are trying to protect the pollutants that may be in the garage from the occupants that are in the home uh, and making sure that the, the, the pollutants don't enter the home. Uh, this is also a good reason why you should not want to put a furnace or air handler in the garage uh, because you don't want any of that air and the, the pollutants from the air entering that air handler and then being distributed into the house. Uh, and this is also crucial that this air sealing be complete. Uh, recessed cans, uh, again, making sure that we uh, caulk and seal because not only have we, uh, with these being airtight, uh, airtight cans and insulation contact rated, but making sure that we address the, the, the barrier, the, the bridge, the gap between that drywall serving as our air barrier and that air barrier can. Uh, so here being done with a, a little bit of caulk, uh, to restore the continuity of that air barrier. As far as plumbing and wiring, making sure that the bat insulation uh, has been cut to fit around uh, plumbing and wiring. Uh, here in the picture, you can see where they've just compressed that bat insulation uh, to fit behind the wiring rather than splitting that bat and bringing part of the insulation behind the wire and then part in front of that wire. Uh, on the bottom uh, is an insulation to readily conform to the available sp space. This could be a blown in, uh, sprayed on, uh, or poured in product. Uh, but again, making sure that it's, it's to the cavity and that you don't compress any of the insulation because anytime you compress the insulation, its benefit goes down. For showers and tubs, uh, this is it, because we are dealing with high heat and humidity, this is a high potential for mold growth. Uh, now the wording here seems a, a little bit uh, a little bit awkward, uh, but really expressing the desire that the shower and tub surround not be part of the continuous air barrier or the insulation layer, that you do your continuous air barrier 
and your insulation layer before you install the, the tub surround uh, or the shower. That also makes the, the detailing a lot easier. And also in the future, when you go to remove that uh, tub or shower, uh, that you don't want to compromise that. For uh, electrical and phone boxes, these are becoming more readily available, uh, but making sure that you're either the air barrier is installed behind the electrical or communications boxes, uh, or that you are using seal, air sealed uh, electrical boxes. Uh, uh, these were very uncommon just a couple of years ago, but they're, they're now readily available in many shapes and sizes so that you, there's not nearly as, as big of a challenge of getting these. Uh, around heating and air register boots, making sure that we bring the air barrier back in. Uh, and while it, it may just uh, appear that we're doing this for the air sealing of the boot itself. Uh, there's a, another uh, there's a, a, another reason why this becomes a problem, and that is Bernoulli's principle, where the air leaving the register will actually induce air from around the boot to flow, and it will actually pull air from around that boot in, from unconditioned airspace into the conditioned space. Uh, concealed sprinklers. Uh, making sure that we provide that air barrier if you have uh, fire sprinklers in your air barrier assembly, uh, but making sure to not use caulking or other adhesive sealants and make sure that you uh, air seal these uh, per the manufacturer's recommendations. So with this, I uh, want to get uh, one more poll for you, and that is one to learn a little bit more about uh, your construction technique, and then I'll turn it over to Robert here in a moment. Okay, well, looks like uh, most everyone has gotten away from the, the traditional three, fra uh, three stud corners uh, and many people have gone to uh, California uh, corners uh, with some even going down to the advanced framing level. So uh, very interesting. So, and with that, uh, we'll go ahead and turn, the, uh, turn it back over to Robert. Good afternoon. Okay, why do we ventilate buildings? Well, the first and really obvious reason is to provide oxygen for occupants. <clears throat> sort of a no-brainer. Uh, but there's a lot of other reasons why we ventilate too. It's, it's uh, uh, pollutant dilution and removal. Uh, as we breathe, we're breathing out CO2, we're releasing CO2, and we're also releasing moisture. Uh, so those are two uh, pollutants that we're trying to uh, dilute and get rid of. Uh, the VOCs, well, we've got carpet glues, we've got cabinets, we've got paints, we've got all kinds of things that are releasing uh, volatile organic compounds, and we're trying to dilute and remove those also. Then there's odors from cooking or, or whatever else uh, in a building, and then uh, depending on what kind of facility it is, if it's an industrial or agricultural building, we may have all other kinds of pollutants that we're trying to get rid of too. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why we're, we're ventilating buildings. Um, 
And when I talk about ventilating buildings, we're talking about uh, fresh air. Uh, we're not talking about return air or, or recycled air. We're talking about the amount of outside air that we're bringing in. And there's different types of ventilation. There's natural ventilation, such as through an open window. Uh, or, or mechanical ventilation, and then there's hybrid, uh, which is a combination. Um, the natural ventilation, we have to have a difference in air pressure between the inside and outside for, for air to move, uh, which there usually is, unless it's uh, identical temperatures uh, on the inside and outside. Usually we have a difference in temperature and that creates a pressure difference. Um, and the natural ventilation, we're seeing more and more of this being incorporated into building design. Uh, uh, we starting to get away from these hermetically sealed buildings that we, we uh, have been building for quite a while. And we're seeing more and more natural ventilation being used in, in building design to uh, cool spaces and provide fresh air. Um, the uh, bottom slide or picture there is from the Zion uh, uh, Visitor Center, uh, the Zion National Park, which is an extremely interesting building where they've got an air catcher that channels air from up high down into the building um, and then provides natural ventilation for, for um, that building. Uh, we're, a lot of us are familiar with mechanical systems. Uh, we use that in, rather than relying on natural ventilation. Um, they have gotten to be some pretty complex systems. And there's, when we talk about me mechanical ventilation, we can have supply ventilation, exhaust ventilation, and balanced ventilation. We try to have balanced ventilation all the time because we don't want to uh, have a high interior pressure or a low interior pressure because that's going to cause air to leak into our building assemblies or out of our building assemblies. So we try to balance the uh, exhaust with the supply, which isn't all the, always the case. Um, if you've probably entered buildings where it's hard to open a door where the building is, where you have too much exhaust, or there's certain facilities that we've been in where the doors were barely shut because we're providing too much supply air and not enough exhaust, and it's almost pushing the doors open. So uh, the balancing of these uh, ventilation streams are critical. In mechanical ventilation, uh, uh, the max amount of outside air that's needed is provi to, that's provided in spaces based on the number of occupants that, will, uh, that space is designed for per code. Uh, so it varies by building type. You know, the office will be different from a hospital, uh, which will be different from other building types. Um, so most buildings are not at maximum occupancy most of the time. Uh, and if we have a fixed ventilation rate, then um, we may be overventilating our spaces. Um, and if energy were free, that might, and if energy didn't have any, con con if energy consumption didn't have any consequences, well, then that might be okay. But there's consequences. It costs extra money to overventilate a space. Um, and it's just not necessary. So we're seeing more and more demand control ventilation where we're actually modulating the amount of outside air that we're introducing into a building based on the number of occupants in the space or the concentration of CO2 in the air. And that's back to Ryan. All right, so with ventilation, uh, now that we have a concept as far as why we do it, uh, we'll touch on a, a few things that the code has to say as far as where we require it. Uh, on the commercial side, uh, it's now required based on uh, chapter four of the International Mechanical Code uh, and making sure that we do provide uh, that outside air uh, in to prevent sick building syndrome. Uh, for spaces that could have highly variable occupancy uh, and making sure that uh, for spaces uh, that we do have demand controlled ventilation uh, in spaces that do have over 500 square feet uh, with an occupant load of at least 25 persons per 1,000 square feet. Uh, 
Now this could be done via an airside economizer, uh, automatic modulating control, uh, a design outdoor airflow uh, higher than three uh, 3000 CFM, uh, as well as there's some exceptions to this. Now while demand controlled ventilation uh, in the past has been very uh, much more complex, uh, there is now becoming more and more uh, actual thermostats that now have demand control ventilation bu capability built into them. Uh, so that can be useful if you have a building that has, uh, say, a single uh, rooftop unit. Uh, and so with these new thermostats, you can now provide demand control ventilation uh, for these uh, single rooftop units. Uh, at a, at a much more reasonable cost than it used to be available at. Uh, enclosed parking garages uh, requires modulation uh, of the uh, ventilation for parking garages. Uh, here again, there's some exceptions for uh, very small systems or very efficient systems that don't have any heating or mechanical cooling. Something that could be a problem if you do have heating or cooling in uh, your in, uh, in your enclosed parking garage is this next requirement about energy recovery for ventilation systems uh, and here calling out that you know where you have the supply rate for a fan system exceeding the value in the table then you need to include energy recovery for the systems uh, now these as you can see uh, for systems that don't operate continuously or less than 8,000 hours a year. And you know, obviously as you get larger and larger systems, making sure that we wanna recover this energy. Uh, but if you go over 8,000 hours, the limit in the 2015 IECC is zero cubic feet per minute. So if you are bringing in any outside air, uh, then you have to do energy recovery on these systems for the commercial. Uh, residential ventilation, uh, again, making sure that we provide ventilation. Uh, and as Robert noted, you know, there's a couple of different ways this can be done, whether uh, it's supply only, exhaust only, or a balanced. Uh, supply only and exhaust only, these can cause uh, moisture issues, particularly as you end up with uh, air leaking through uh, your assemblies. Uh, potentially causing some indoor air quality issues uh, through that air leakage. Uh, balanced systems, uh, once you begin to look at balanced systems, this makes energy recovery and heat recovery uh, much easier to do uh, in a single unit to provide uh, both the supply, the, the exhaust, and heat recovery for this. Uh, but we do require ventilation uh, per the mechanical code uh, or the other requirements uh, within the code. Uh, and that the intake and exhaust need to have automatic or gravity dampers that close uh, when the system is not operating. Uh, now there is a series of additional Illinois amendments to this uh, that we've listed here. A lot of this is just referencing or, or bringing the uh, international residential code requirements into uh, the Illinois Energy Conservation Code. Uh, so rather than adopting the entire IRC, uh, this brings specific segments of it into it. Uh, so with that, I know we are a little short on time. We'll, we'll answer a couple of questions here, uh, but if you do have questions, uh, we will go ahead and uh, if we don't answer them uh, here within the webinar, we will uh, get back with you uh, regarding an answer. Uh, and so if you do have questions, feel free to, to send them in. And if you think of questions uh, at another time, feel free to reach out to us. Or if you have any questions regarding the energy code and you need some assistance on it, uh, feel free to reach us, uh, particularly with our email address, energy code at cdac.org. Uh, I see here uh, we have a question regarding, uh, looks like blower doors for old homes uh, for renovations. Uh, the 
uh, IECC for home renovations uh, does not require blower door testing. However, uh, it uses the uh, renovations use the prescriptive requirements. Uh, so that's, that more looks at, you know, your building materials and insulation values uh, and making sure that, that those comply uh, rather than uh, focusing on an, uh, the actual air test itself. Uh, and that's predominantly for practical reasons because, you know, you can't expect, you know, if you do an addition uh, or a renovation to a, a you know 1900s home and you, you renovate a room or, or put a small addition on, you can't expect that 1900s home to, to pass an air test. Uh, here's another question on the, the air barrier location, uh, whether it's dependent on the, the climate of the project. Uh, the air barrier, I don't believe the, the code calls out a specific location. Now the vapor barrier would be very important on the location depending on the, the, the climate. The air barrier is not uh, is not specified based on the climate. Uh, now it's not uncommon for air barriers to be used as for vapor barriers, in which case you would want to uh, that you would want to uh, be aware of that. Uh, here noting that uh, while we did list the 16 items that the code specifically calls out as uh, air barriers, there are many, many air barriers out there uh, that the code does not specifically list that does meet the, uh, the code requirement uh, of, of the, the 0 .004 Q CFM per square foot. Uh, so uh, that is... Uh, that is definitely true that there are many, many air barriers that are not listed specifically in the code. I think that's probably about all the time we have today. Uh, so uh, as noted earlier, this is recorded uh, and we will make, uh, make the copy of the uh, slides as well as uh, the presentation available. Uh, slides will be available on our, uh, on our website. Uh, so I want to thank everyone for attending today. Uh, and again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to CDAC at energycode at cdac.org. And everyone have a great afternoon.